on Praise from Washington, D.C., former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. And now, Eric Stekovac. Welcome to a very special edition of Praise from Washington, D.C. I'm joined by two men who really need no introduction, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. We can also, gentlemen, add two new titles to your resume, movie stars. You are the stars of the brand new TBN film, Route 60, The Biblical Highway, in theaters nationwide, September 18th and 19th. Gentlemen, we will talk about the film but we also want to give everyone a broader kind of geopolitical world events overview. Of course, you two were high level officials in the Trump administration. You were in the room when major decisions were made in the Middle East and really throughout the world. So we want to unpack that with you a bit as well. Secretary, let's start with you. Since you and Ambassador Friedman left your post in January 2021, what do you see as the state of the world. We'll talk about the Pompeo Doctrine, um, your worldview as Secretary of State. What is the state of things right now in the United States, in particular in the Middle East and in the foreign policy realm? Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be back with you again. Uh, look, uh, when we left in January of 2021, uh, there was peace breaking out all across the Middle East. It was uh, not by accident, it was, it was by a lot of hard work. Uh, certainly the Lord was watching over it, um, but we were diligent, we were focused on this. And unfortunately, the current administration has gone back to some of the same ideas that had prevented that peace for decades. Ideas that this is an, uh, that the West Bank is somehow occupied by the Israelis. Um, ideas that somehow uh, you can negotiate with the Iranians and make the Middle East a safer place. Those were ideas that we just rejected. They didn't, they didn't reflect the reality as we had come to see it. Uh, and it's not about politics. This is about you know, the fact that we've had lots of Americans have to go and fight and risk their lives in that place over the last decades. And to the extent you can build out a secure, stable security relation, set of relationships where the Gulf states can come to understand that Israel is a great security partner and a great economic partner and, so, and, and they're good people. And you can build that out in the way that we were able to do with lots of great leaders being part of it. Uh, sadly, I think we're heading back in a direction that makes the chance of that extending of the peace uh, much less likely, and it saddens me greatly. Yeah, Secretary, we're going to talk more about that. Ambassador Friedman, of course, you were in the middle of the historic embassy move in Jerusalem. The Trump administration obviously recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. You're out of your post now, of course, but you still, still spend time in Israel frequently. Uh, what is your sense of things on the ground, in the land, the land of Israel right now? Well, look, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the, uh, the move of the embassy appears to be permanent because it is so popular really with, with all Americans, and thank God for that. Um, Israel's going through a, a rough patch. Uh, they've got a lot of internal debates about what the country should look like, how it should be governed. Issues that have been around since the beginning of the state, but are sort of percolating up right now for, uh, uh, not, not surprisingly to me. Um, what I'm disappointed in uh, mostly is the American, uh, if, I, if you will, interference with that process. I mean, this is hard enough for Israel on its own. They have to get through some difficult issues about, you know, uh, you know the separation of powers, you know, between the Knesset and the Supreme Court, who, uh, you know, who trumps who, who has the ultimate decision. It's a tough issue. It's a legitimate issue. And they'll have to work it out. But let them work it out. And, and don't make it uh, an, an American issue. Uh, one thing that we never did, you know, we respected Israel's democracy and we allowed them to go through their internal issues, just as we would expect them to extend the same courtesy to us. You know, when people were talking about packing the Supreme Court because they didn't like the outcome of their various decisions, you didn't hear uh, Netanyahu, you know, go on TV and say that's a bad idea or a good idea. It was none of his business. And frankly, it's none of our business how Israel resolves these issues. Instead, we have a government that is, uh, you know, very much got their thumb on the scale. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel has not been invited to the, uh, to the White House. The prior Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, was invited. Uh, I think uh, Biden, you know, has, has made it clear that that's not 
something happening anytime soon. And he, by the way, Ambassador, has a long-standing relationship with yeah. Bibi Netanyahu. Yeah, he calls him Bibi, and he yeah. says he knows him, but he doesn't uh, consider that to be uh, enough of a reason to bring him over, even though it's our most cherished, most important ally in the region, if not the world. So that is, uh, that is a disappointment. And it's not just a matter of courtesy, it's a matter of the signal it sends to the region. That you know, whenever there is a signal by the United States that there is daylight between America and Israel, it then encourages um, terrorists, it encourages Israel's enemies, and encourages our enemies. And we're seeing that on the ground. We're seeing a rise in terror attacks that you know is is pretty uh, serious. Yeah, including in Judea and Samaria, gentlemen, which the world calls the West Bank. It is the biblical heartland. The Bible calls it Judea and Samaria, and is it is the scene for the film. Route 60, the biblical <laughs> highway. Ambassador, we'll talk about your role in, or, and your heart, I should say, for Judea and Samaria in a second, going back years. But Secretary, uh, when you were Secretary of State, you made some pretty major announcements in regard to Judea and Samaria and Israel's historic and ancient claim uh, to that region. Tell us more about that, your perspective on why Israelis, Jews, have every right to live in the same regions they lived in 3,000 years ago. You know, it's interesting. It, people talk about it's historic and groundbreaking, and I just think about 3,000 years. Right? <laughs> just the, the, that what we did was simply reflect the reality, the history of this being the proper homeland of the Jewish people for 3,000 years, including Judea and Samaria. And so we had a lot of history, American history, that we had to clear out, a lot of underbrush, a lot of uh, I won't get too far in the weeds, but suffice it to say, for, for decades, and this was bipartisan, uh, no president had prepare, been prepared to simply make declarative statements about Israel and its place in the world and the way we were. And so, you know, the, the movement of the embassy, President Trump was remarkable. Um, so many other presidents had just refused to do that. I, I give him full credit for um, having made that. But we could all see that if we got this right, if we, if we spoke about history and the reality and the way that it was, that we didn't risk World War III. This was always the implicit threat. If you if you make a statement uh, sim as simple as, this is not land occupied by the Israelis. This is not an apartheid nation, right? This is, there, these not every settlement that is in Judea and Samaria is unlawful, which had been the American position for an awfully long time. Just these simple statements, yeah. it, it turns out the rest of the world goes, yeah, no, that that's right. Uh, yeah. that, that makes some sense. And you don't get World War III. What you get is serious engagement on a sound footing that can deliver better lives for everyone. Yeah. Christians, Jews, Arabs, everyone living in that space is in a better place as a result of what we did. It can be said that for everything we wish to learn or want to become, there is a road to follow. From the beginning, the road to believing in only one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, has carved its route through the ancient land of Israel. It is a road that Abraham, the father of nations, walked as the first believer in monotheism. It was along this road that God made his covenant with Abraham, promising that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It is a road walked by Jesus, the central figure of Christianity. This road is deeply symbolic in the story of God shared by Jews and Christians. And it is a literal highway that bisects modern Israel, where it is now known simply as Route 60. Route 60 follows the ancient path from Nazareth to Beersheba. It connects many holy sites and biblical events in what could be called the original Bible Belt. It has mile markers, human and divine, to memorialize the acts of celebration, suffering and salvation that are woven into Israel's history. I'm David Friedman, and I invite you to join me and my co-host and fellow traveler, Mike Pompeo as we explore the ancient mysteries of Route 60, the biblical highway.
folks, the film is called Route 60. You can go to route60.movie for more information in theaters nationwide, September 18th and 19th. We are joined, of course, by former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, uh, David Friedman. David, I mentioned your heart for Judea and Samaria. To you, this is, it's common sense, first of all, that look, uh, from a security perspective, we can go on and on why Israel should have a presence in Judea and Samaria. Uh, but for you, it's also a matter of the heart and a matter of your faith. Tell us more about that, your connection, your personal connection to Judea and Samaria and why you believe our viewers and people who go to see this movie will connect with that region as well. Well, look, Eric, uh, I think as you know, I'm the son of a rabbi, yeah. and I spent probably uh, the first 12 years of my education uh, studying the Bible in Hebrew, and, uh, and it, it resonated with me from early, early uh, years. Now, that Bible, okay, that Old Testament that I studied, uh, is full of stories. And these aren't just stories. These are stories that give real life lessons, lessons that we take with us and apply to how we live our lives in a meaningful way, in an appropriate way, in a God-fearing way. And, you know, when you take those lessons and then you connect them to the places where those stories occurred, you know, they're no longer, they're not legends. I mean, these are real, true stories. They actually happened. And they happened at these places. So when you have the privilege of going to these places, and most of them, most of these stories took place in what people call the West Bank. You know, that's, that's the land. I mean, when Jews <laughs> were given this land, you know, I mean, I love Tel Aviv. I think it's a great city, but Tel Aviv is not a biblical city, right? I mean, uh, neither is Haifa. You know, when, when Jews were given the land, they were given what people call the West Bank. And, and to me, it's painful. When I hear, you know, people talk about the biblical heartland of the Jewish people not belonging to the Jewish people, that somehow it's outrageous, it's unlawful, it's, it's apartheid for the Jewish people to live in the land promised them by God uh, in the land where all the stories took place. And in a world today, where we live, where I think we've become uh, so untethered from our, you know, biblical values as, as a nation. You know, uh, you, you look around and you get very confused about, you know, what, what's life really about? What's important? What's meaningful? What should we be doing? Yeah. Well, this brings it right back to the basics, to the basics, the basic values that I think made our nation a great nation, made Judaism and Christianity great faiths, and it's all there. And so returning there, I think, is, is the key. To, to living a, a good, God-fearing, meaningful life. And by the way, Ambassador, you can tell in the film, I was thinking throughout and watching with your biblical knowledge or biblical storytelling, certainly you are the son of a rabbi and <laughs> same with you, Secretary Pompeo, former Sunday school teacher. And that really shines through. And I, gentlemen, I think that's what's so unique about the film. Former, obviously, high-ranking U.S. officials, you're still in the mix on the geopolitical scene in a major way, and yet, it was almost, I think you were discussing off camera, almost uh, as believers, kind of almost a childlike quality when you came <laughs> upon some of these sites along Route 60. Um, we want to talk more about that, but I did want to ask you, I touched on the security perspective of it, gentlemen. Look, Judea and Samaria, not only the biblical heartland, obviously so much controversy in the world, these, these pictures painted of wild-eyed Israeli settlers, but break it down for, from a security perspective. Um, Samaria is a mountainous region, and if Israel gave this land over, the land which Route 60 winds through, if Israel was to give that region up, that would be a security liability for the state of Israel, it seems. Secretary, what are your thoughts on that? When you walk the road and you then travel to your point, we're, we're talking about a, a very small place. Uh, this is not, we think as Americans, we think about the expanse of the United States. Um, this is a place that is difficult to secure, and the Israelis do amazing work in doing that, securing it for everyone. We should be mindful, not just for Jews, but for Christians and Arabs and non-believers. Uh, this, is, this is the lone democracy and the safest place in the Middle East. Sometimes we see the pictures and we see the smoke and we think, oh, this is just cowboys and Indians of old, right? Yeah. Um, it's not that way. When you see this movie, when folks watch the movie, they will come to see that most of this is just people living trying to find their way yeah. through, and that there are mm -hmm. simply bad actors. Uh, bad actors in this place that have agendas that are deeply inconsistent with the history of the place. And so the mission that we all have is to try and bring people together in a way that reflects the history, the rightful history, and we, we know what happens when Israel gives this up. We, we can see it today in the Gaza Strip. We can see what Hamas has built there, the terror organization underwritten by Iran in that place. 
Uh, we should all be mindful as we think about how to continue to deliver security uh, that simply walking away to handing this over to uh, a set of leaders that live in that place today in Ramallah um, is not something that would secure peace for anyone in the region. And folks, by the way, just a reminder, Israel is the size of the state of New Jersey with its current borders. I guess it would be roughly the size of Delaware if it were to give away uh, <laughs> Judea and Samaria. Many have called those indefensible borders. Again, Route60.movie, September 18th and 19th, theaters nationwide. If you want to hear more great insights like this, from Ambassador Friedman and Secretary Pompeo, but with a biblical perspective even better, please go see the movie. I can tell you, folks, this film is completely unique, uh, so well produced, gentlemen. Your insights, amazing, and you're going to places where even I have never set foot. I've been to Israel many, many times, <laughs> and certainly I think many of our viewers will have their eyes wide open and say, wow, this is really the Bible uh, coming to life. Ambassador Friedman, when I think of Judea, Samaria, this region, the biblical heartland, which again, Route 60 winds through, and people move out there um, to live, and of course there are controversial areas in the world's eyes, but it reminds me almost of people kind of moving out to the suburbs, the exurbs here in the United States. You're going out there, maybe lower cost of living, fresh air, better quality of life, a uh, better quality of life for your family. It seems that many of the people who live in Judea and Samaria are actually secular. Is is that true? Yeah, it's true. And I think they get a ridiculously bad rap, you know, from <laughs> the mainstream media. Uh, yeah. Look, I, um, I'm well acquainted with with the entire community. And it's it's large. It's about a half a million Jewish people living in Judea and Samaria. And, uh, and, you know, since the world considers Jerusalem as well, you know, illegally occupied, you know, another three, four hundred thousand Jews living in East Jerusalem that uh, that the, the world considers uh, yeah. to be illegal. Um, look, they're um, they, they're all they, they are the the entire fabric of, of Israel from secular to to religious, I mean, to ultra orthodox. They're they they, they are not at all a, a hostile people. They are not um, looking for a fight. They are not looking to uh, Put uh, you know to, to to be provocative. They're looking, as you point out, to live their lives in peace, and um, and and I think that's now you know you'll you'll have uh, in any society uh, a small group of people where if they are provoked, they will respond probably inappropriately occasionally, and uh, and that gets a hundred percent of the of the media attention, not ninety nine percent, a hundred percent of the media attention, and the other you know. The other, the other almost entire rest of the time when people are living, and by the way, there there are many um, there are many uh, you know factories and uh, industrial centers in Judea and Samaria uh, where Jews and, uh, and and Palestinians work together, and, uh, and and those are the most uh, successful examples of of coexistence. But there are others as well, and um, and and look, I think if you ask anybody living there, they'll say we want to live with the Palestinians. We're not looking to evict anybody. We want to live together. We want to work together. We think we can prosper together, um, and uh, and that's their view. Um, there, there is no one. I literally no one that I've spoken with who wants to uh, evict any peaceful Palestinian from their territory. No one. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I've filmed for TBN at some of those factories, ambassador in Samaria. And there are many Palestinians working there, sure. and they make a better wage in Israel than they would in the West Bank. So very interesting. You mentioned Jerusalem, Ambassador. I want to touch, if we're talking broader geopolitical Middle East, we need to touch on Iran eventually, and I think that ties into the Pompeo Doctrine. But gentlemen, Jerusalem. You mentioned Jerusalem. Um, look, 2018, obviously, the historic move of the embassy to God's one and only holy city. Ambassador, we've talked many times about this. You are the first ambassador to serve at that Jerusalem embassy. But Secretary Pompeo, take us inside Foggy Bottom, uh, not too far from here, the State Department, which hasn't always been seen necessarily as a pro-Israel branch of the government, perhaps. Eric, uh, a very diplomatic of you. You, you. you might be able to work there. I'm in D.C. I'm trying. I'm learning from you, Secretary. Uh, but hey... Obviously, earth-shattering announcement, not shattering for people like us who say, right on, about time, but at the State Department, and you're at the helm. You had, I want people to realize how courageous this was of Secretary Pompeo, Ambassador Friedman, uh, to push this 
in, in a meaningful way, you had to have a lot of pushback, I would imagine, yeah. as you started discussing yeah. so, this. So, Eric, I was actually still at the CIA. Uh, I was the CIA director when the, the embassy move took place. Right. Uh, but very connected with Secretary Tillerson at the time in the yeah. State Department, working these issues in Judea and Samaria, security focused as the CIA director. So I could see this. You should know the Central Intelligence yeah. Agency largely shared the views of the State Department with respect to, yeah. to how to keep the... They, they would view it as how do you keep the lid on this thing? How do you reflect this? And, and how do you not advantage the nation of Israel versus the people who are living, uh, uh, the Arabs who are living in the West Bank? And so there was enormous pushback. Yeah. Uh, there was the specter that had been raised for so long, which is uh, there'll be, uh, you know, the the in, in, next intifada or worse yet, the Iranians will become involved. This, this will escalate in a way that is uncontrollable and unforeseeable and we can... Yeah. But I knew, and I think David knew. Um, we, we knew that that was that was a that was a view that if if it had ever been true, no longer existed. Yeah. That leaders in Arab countries and the world around the world understood that the Palestinians had blown every opportunity to make peace, yeah. and that we needed to find a path forward towards peace, ir- uh, regardless of uh, what the the leaders of the Palestinian Authority wanted to do. And so President Trump. Uh, moved against, you know, uh, large pieces of the uh, establishment of the State Department at the Central Intelligence Agency, nearly everyone who would have worked for David in the embassy, yeah. and took a decision, and it, it has turned out to be not only important and decent and right, um, but has reflected our understanding of what would really happen in the world after such a move. Uh, uh, David's point about it being permanent is a glorious thing. I'm confident that it is. And that will be a good thing, not only for the nation of Israel, but for all people. This is ancient Israel right here. And and it was all so that people could have the maximum ability to see the tabernacle. It's the capital of the Jewish tradition until Jerusalem becomes the place where God was for the Jewish people. Me, I think of the story of Hannah. Uh, my wife was in a Hannah circle at church at Eastminster Presbyterian, a lot of Hannah circles. Uh, these are women who are deeply prayerful, who love their Lord. Uh, Hannah loved her Lord and wanted a baby. <laughs> yeah. And Hannah prayed and prayed and prayed, and God miraculously provided her with a child. This child was Samuel. Samuel, of course, becomes a great leader. And Hannah's uh, prayer, uh, many think it was the beginning of prayer. It was uh, a beautiful liturgical prayer, and she uh, sat by herself uh, in the tabernacle. Uh, the priest's name was Ailey, and Ailey looked at her praying, and he'd never seen anybody move their lips like that in supplication before. Most of the time, you're moving your lips, you're, you're saying something, you're speaking loudly. Here is somebody whispering uh, fervently to herself. What does Ailey say to Hannah? You gotta stop drinking. Get rid of the wine. And she said to him, I'm not drunk. I'm letting my heart speak to God. Many people think that's where prayer began. Uh, Ambassador, when it comes to Jerusalem, I mean, first of all, it's one of the main stops in this incredible new film that you are the stars of. Our TBN film, Route 60, The Biblical Highway, in theaters, folks. Again, September 18th and 19th, go to route60.movie for more information. But hey, Shiloh, Shiloh, uh, Nazareth, Hebron, Mount Ebal, Jerusalem, it's just absolutely incredible the stops you make. Uh, But Jerusalem for you, in reading your book, Sledgehammer, you lay out how when you took this post, this was an agenda that you wanted to really focus on. It's about time to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, Take us inside your thought process there. And it was a long and winding road, but you got there. Well, look, it was something I was committed to do uh, to the extent I was given the runway from the day I was appointed. It was even in the press release that announced my nomination. Um, Look, you know, people ask me sometimes, you know, how did you know that there wouldn't be any violence? You know, how did you know? Because, you know, you're talking about a big world out there. And how do you know that one guy somewhere, one lunatic's not going to throw a hand grenade into a crowd of people, right? And, and I'm telling you, if that would have happened, I would have gotten a call the next day from the president and saying, what have you done to me here? Like, what, what if, what's, what's going on? And I might have lost my job. So how did it happen? How were you so smart? The answer is, I wasn't. I didn't know. Nobody can know. It's not knowable. 
right, that nowhere in the world there's going to be any act of violence. But there wasn't any. And so, uh, look, we did all the work that we could possibly do to assess the risks. And uh, at the end of the day, we thought that the risks were, were manageable. But, you know, uh, I, I look back uh, during those days to the book, uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 2. And I would recommend everybody take a look at this. Because in the second chapter of Isaiah, there was sort of the paradigm for peace that it says, you know, nation will not lift up sword against nation or study war anymore. Right? It's on the wall of the United Nations, right? It's what everybody sort of accepts as the end state. But they don't tell you how to get there. Right? But Isaiah actually does, if you read a couple of verses earlier. And what he says is that the nations of the world, not the Jewish people, the nations of the world will all come to Jerusalem, whereupon God will resolve their differences, and then nation will not lift up sword against nation. Now, how does a nation come to Jerusalem? Right? You, know, you can't all pick up and go. Well, the one way a nation can actually establish its presence in another country is by moving its embassy. So Isaiah, 2,700 years ago, predicted that moving our embassy to Jerusalem would result in peace. You know, in 2018, all the pundits, all the great minds, you know, all the, you know, all of our predecessors were saying, you move the embassy to Jerusalem, you're going to have endless wars and irreconcilable conflicts. Isaiah said the opposite 2,700 years ago. Now, who was right? 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 Who was right? Isaiah. I think the prophet was proven right. And I shook my head about that, gentlemen. During that whole process, the announcement was made December 2017, the embassy was moving. And people said, oh, my word, this is going to set the Middle East on fire. I said, where have you been for like the last 2,000 years? It's been on fire for a while already. Um, I'd be remiss as well if I did not mention the recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Uh, as part of, I think, the Pompeo Doctrine, which I'd like to touch on again, Secretary. Look, we talk about Judea and Samaria obviously being the high ground in many ways, but Whoever possesses the Golan, hey, you're looking down. This is literally the, the high Galilee. ground. <laughs> yes, it is literally the, the high ground. Tell us a bit about your thought process uh, regarding that and also how that really, the Golan, I said when we're talking Pompeo doctrine and the geopolitics of the region, you got to talk about Iran, really the head of the snake when it comes to terror in the region. Talk about your thought process there regarding pushing back Iran's advances in particular in Syria? So two, two thoughts I think are worth walking through. The Golan is so obviously central to Israeli security yeah. and so fundamentally important to the Jewish people, right? This is this place matters. There have been Israelis have fought and died in that place. It is also, anybody who's had the chance to go there, this is pretty easy for visitors to get to, yeah. can see. Beautiful. It's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yes. When Christians go to Galilee, it's it's a, it's a easy to get there. And you can see, just as a, 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 as a security matter, th this real estate matters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it was important. Uh, and President Trump, again, with David Friedman full on in support made the right decision. This was this was Israeli land for sure, and so it was a, this was a kind of a, an easy one for us. Um, at the same time, we also knew that just across the border from the Golan is Syria, and in Syria you have huge Iranian operations. Yeah. The Iranians, uh, when we came into office, were in the middle of negotiations uh, that had concluded, or were, were at the end of negotiations that had concluded an agreement which put Israel, uh, Israel at enormous risk had created a pathway for an Iranian nuclear weapons program. Uh, there's a lot of complexity around it, but suffice it to say, the world was a lot less safe as a result of that. So not only did President Trump make the decision to move our embassy to Jerusalem and to acknowledge the Golan Heights as the rightful land of Israel, but we got out of a bad deal that put our partner, our Israeli partner, at an enormous amount of risk. And the, the results of all of those, the cumulative results of all of those were Gulf Arab nations saying, these are serious people in the United States. This is serious leadership in Israel. We want to be, we want to be partners and part of what they're trying yeah. to do. And so um, we pushed back against the Iranian threat in serious ways. Uh, and it's, you know, it's incredibly important to the nation of Israel. Uh, it matters a lot to the Middle East. But if you think about families in the United States and whose son or daughter might sign up to be a Marine or join the Air Force, the, the risk that they'll have to go do something really hard in that really difficult place someday is simply lower as a result of the work that we did. Yeah, and uh, Ambassador, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to just interject something because Mike's too modest to, uh, to mention it. But um, we were together in Israel when the <laughs> Go on Heights uh, announcement yeah. was made. It was a big one. And it, was, and it wasn't something that either one of us was expecting. I mean, we were expecting after we spoke with the president, but until then, it wasn't something that was on the agenda for that particular visit. So yeah. 
it's, uh, let's say it's 5 p.m. in Israel, and, uh, and, and Mike and uh, the Prime Minister are making joint statements at the Prime Minister's house two hours later. Right, and, and, and nobody was... The think- tweet had gone out, if I recall, yes. from yes, then yes. President Correct. Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no one's thinking, you know, you know, you prepare for these things. These are not yeah. like spontaneous eruptions, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, so they were prepared for something. All of a sudden, the whole agenda changes, right? Because it's now about this historic decision on the Golan Heights. So Mike gets up there and he starts, he makes a speech. And I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I didn't know what he was going to talk about. And he starts talking about... Um, the Battle of the Valley of Tears, right, which was in 1973. It was the, the, the turning point of the Yom Kippur War, where Israel yeah. finally turned the tide. A single soldier named the Victor Kahalani, who won you know, great awards in Israel, he managed to convince the Syrians that there were more tanks there than there really were for long enough until they got their reinforcement, right? So it turns out that Mike you know, wrote about this uh, for his kind of senior thesis at West Point. <laughs> right. So he's an expert on this. Nobody knew this. <laughs> he's an expert. So he gets up with no, without any notice. He's t- talking about this historic battle. I'm sitting there like, where did that come from? <laughs> but uh, he's talking about this battle. And then he talks about how, you know, how much it means to him that, you know, that we now know with certainty that the people who died in that battle, the, the Jews, the Israeli soldiers who died in that battle, you know, will not have died in vain because the Golan Heights that they fought so valiantly for will now be, you know, considered by not just Israel, but by the United States as Israeli sovereign territory. And it was, uh, it was a real moment. And then, you know, some, uh, some months or years later, I think towards the end of our yeah. time, um, I surprised him. He went to visit the Golan Heights and I brought uh, uh, General Kahalani, who yeah. he didn't even know if he was still alive or not. <laughs> I brought him and they met there at the Golan Heights and they were able to... Yeah. Uh, to, to, to talk to each other. That had to be a special yeah, It was very and, emotional, very special. Yeah, and someone who served, we should have mentioned, Secretary, with distinction in the U.S. military uh, as well. Folks, the film is called Route 60, The Biblical Highway. It is in theaters nationwide, September 18th and 19th. Go to route60.movie. And as you can see, you're getting not only, it's unique, I think, because we have a former Secretary of State, a former ambassador to Israel, but approaching things from a biblical perspective. So it's fascinating and unique, folks. You're going to enjoy it. Um, Secretary, I wanted to add, when we talk about the Pompeo Doctrine and Iran, we'd be remiss not to mention the not-so-dearly-departed terror master Qasem Soleimani, uh, one of the key decisions you helped make uh, in office as Secretary of State we talk about the Valley of Tears ambassador and wars that Israel has fought. Uh, perhaps some future wars were at least delayed in seeing him taken off the scene. Well, the central responsibility for any uh, Secretary of State is to reduce the risk of war. Yeah. Uh, and we were at a point where the Iranians were beginning to threaten U.S. forces uh, worldwide. We are, had an embassy, in, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was under attack nearly every night from artillery rounds. There were lots that we, we were slipping. Our deterrence was slipping. Uh, and then uh, a bunch of work that had been done over the previous years, uh, when I was CI director alongside Mossad, um, that work presented an opportunity. And we had a chance to take out this general, uh, General Qasem Soleimani, who had killed 500 plus Americans, he had blood on his hands, and he was in fact traveling to commit further aggression against the United States. He was, he was headed from Beirut to Damascus to Baghdad, and we had an opportunity to uh, eliminate his capacity to ever kill another American. And so I went down with Secretary Esper and uh, General Milley to Mar-a-Lago, brief the president on something we'd been talking to him about for a long time. Uh, But now we had the opportunity and uh, an active plot by General Soleimani to kill more Americans. The president gave the green light and uh, the U.S. Department of Defense uh, executed an incredible mission taking Qasem Soleimani from the battlefield. It was was important in the moment. It saved lives in the near term. But very, very importantly, it, it also made clear that the Trump administration, when it drew a line, when it said, if you behave in a way that's inconsistent with the things we've told you you must do, um, that we will actually deliver the cost that we have told you we will impose. We drew a red line. We walk, When they crossed it, we responded exactly as we told them we would do. 
And I'm convinced that that saved an awful lot of the Iranian threat during the remaining time we had in office. Yeah, true deterrence. And I think of another former president, a man we, I think we all admire, President Ronald Reagan, who said, peace through strength. Um, and we certainly saw that with the Qasem Soleimani elimination. Uh, Ambassador Friedman, what is the view, two questions here, what is the view in Israel generally about the Iran threat and Hamas and Hezbollah? You're on the ground, obviously, frequently yeah. still in Israel. And number two, how does the average Israeli feel? We know uh, Secretary Pompeo and I as American evangelicals, we love Judea Samaria, we see it the biblical heartland. How does the average Israeli feel about Route 60? Do they realize the spiritual significance of this incredible road? So, you know, because um, Israelis are, are right there, sometimes, you know, you get caught up in daily lives, right? So they, they have to, you know, feed their families and get the kids off to school. And the ones that aren't living there are, are, are not living there, and they're, they're not there that frequently. But I'll tell you, what I, here's what I think is, is, is noteworthy. So I've spoken to a lot of Israelis that don't live in Judea and Samaria, and I asked them about it, and I say, do you care about it? And they said, well, we care about it, but we don't go there that often because, you know, we're, we're, when we travel, we tend to, you know, yeah. go to Greece or Italy or America. Um, so I said, well, what do, you think about, um, what do you think about giving it away? They said, well, you know, Maybe if there was peace, I, we'd give away some of it. Um, we're skeptical about peace right now, but so I said, let's take, let's pick a place, just hypothetically. Let's take, let's say, the city of uh, Shiloh, right? Shiloh in, in America, right? Um, this is where the uh, this is the first place where the Jews stopped wandering. This is where the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, rested for three hundred and sixty-nine years, right? This is where Hannah, you know, taught the world how to pray, right? The first, I mean, it's a very important place. So I said. What do you think about what do you think about that? Would you would you give that away for peace? And they say, Oh no, never. And these are secular people. Never. I said, Well, why not? Well, this is part of our DNA. This is who we are as a people. I mean, if we give away our, you know, it's like asking an American, would you give away the Statue of Liberty? Would you give away the Jefferson Memorial? I mean, these things just don't are not for sale. They're not, they're not, you know, and 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 even secular Israelis, I believe, they still know the Bible. I mean, you still learn the Bible in school. And I believe that 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 even they will 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 would, would be very resistant to conceding the the holy sites because understand if you give them away, not only do you never see them again, but they'll be destroyed. Yeah. I mean, look at the you know we we know for example the the tomb of Joseph, right? Extremely important place to the Jewish people yeah. to anyone who's a Bible believer. Every time there is any kind of a conflict, and it's seen in the film, by the way. Yes, and it's, it's in the film. Yeah. It's in the film. We talk mm -hmm. about it. Right. But it, 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 gets, uh, it gets destroyed and rebuilt every couple of years because the Palestinians regrettably would like to eliminate, you know, uh, our biblical connection to the land. And, and this is right within a, you know, a very, you know, solid Palestinian yeah. community. So if you give this away, if you give any of these places away, not only do you never see them again, but they will cease to exist. And I don't believe that, that we can live in a world where the Jewish people or the Christian people, anyone of faith, can be detached from these incredibly holy places. Even if you only go there once in your life, it's enough. Yes. It's enough to, 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 to recharge your batteries, yeah. you know, to be a believer and to lead a faithful life. The next best thing is to watch the movie, right? <laughs> and, and, and hopefully we'll get a lot of people to watch the movie. It will recharge people's batteries of faith. Speaking of the film, let's go to a clip right now from Route 60, The Biblical Highway. Deep within every lover of Israel is a desire to follow the path of Scripture where the heroes of our faith walk. Join David Friedman and Mike Pompeo as they guide you on just such a road. Israel's Route 60, a literal biblical highway guiding travelers along sites key to Scripture. It's a close-up look at the land of the Bible as you've never seen it. Join us for this sacred journey of transformation and hope along Route 60, the biblical highway in theater September 18th and 19th. Incredible folks, again, September 18th and 19th, Route 60, the Biblical Highway is in theaters nationwide. Go to route60.movie. We have to talk about the Abraham Accords. You were both intimately involved in the Accords becoming a reality, seemingly against all odds to many people on the outside. But when we talk about the shaping of the modern Middle East and, and the positive, encouraging things that happened uh, during your tenure. We have to talk about the Abraham Accords. Uh, Secretary, take us inside again. Take us inside the room at Foggy Bottom, a few minutes from here, the State Department in Washington, D.C. 
And was there an optimism? We know you were optimistic and you wrote about this in your great book, Never Give an Inch. We know your optimism for peace between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors. What was the consensus among your colleagues? Were you kind of a voice crying in the wilderness there at the State <laughs> Department? Sure. Uh, look, the State Department is an establishment institution that thinks what we did yesterday is the thing we should do tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and so when we were there breaking some glass, uh, in, in a way that David wrote about in his book, Sledgehammer, right? We, we were literally we were upending uh, lots of history. And I'll, I'll let David begin the story, but it's important to put in context. As we began to think about the Middle East, right? We, we knew that previous secretaries of state had done shuttle diplomas. And they'd go, from, they'd go from Jerusalem to Ramallah and back and forth, and they'd argue over lines on a map endlessly. Uh, we recognized we'd be no more successful at that than anyone else. And so we took a fundamentally different approach. And David, maybe that's the place for you to yeah. start the story. The well, point. look, we, we, we started off with uh, the idea directed by the president that we should try to uh, develop a plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And we quickly, re quickly realized this was just a fool's errand. I mean, it, it, you know, we, we could put something on a piece of paper, but you know, anything that you know, included a, a state of Israel on the map, whatever size and whatever dimensions, was going to be recognized by the Palestinians as a Jewish state yeah. was going to be dead on arrival. So we said to ourselves, well, for the next three years or four years, however long we have, do we just, you know, kind of lament our situation or do we try to make progress? And what we found was that, um, you know, the, the Gulf nations, which are strong allies of America, they don't hate Israel. You know, I mean, they, they have issues with with the, with the, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But so does, so do the Brits, right? I mean, so does Canada, you know, so does India. I mean, so do other, a lot of countries that have relations with Israel still don't necessarily see eye to eye on the Palestinian conflict. So we said, well, can we put that off to the side? We're not gonna resolve it. We may never resolve it, okay? Put that off to the side. Does Israel still have something to gain? Do these countries still have something to gain from normalizing with each other? And we found Real, real receptivity um, on the part of, of these countries. And, you know, we, we, we discussed it, we walked it through. Um, I worked mostly the Israeli side. You know, Jared worked with, the, uh, with some of these uh, Gulf nations. Mm -hmm. And then we thought we had a package that was 75% baked, and then we brought it over here to, uh, you know, to the <laughs> Secretary of State and said, here, bring it home, you know, yeah. see what you can do. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's, you know, uh, we, we were amazed. We were amazed at the willingness on the part of both Israel and, 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 and moderate Sunni nations, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, um, even Kosovo in Europe, we were amazed that they were willing to move on. You know, again, not to say we agree uh, with any particular resolution to the Palestinian conflict, but we can agree to disagree and still do wonderful things among ourselves that will make the world a safer and more prosperous place. In covering this gentleman for TBN, I've, I've been to Bahrain, to the United Arab Emirates, in the wake of the Abraham Accords, and the flights are full. It's absolutely and miraculous, I would say, even. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, planes full of Israelis going back and forth to the UAE. Even 10 years ago, this was unthinkable. It seems like, as you both lay it out, just plain common sense, but we live in times where common sense is not so common. Uh, so there was a great deal of pushback there. One of the great things about Route 60 is the film is completely apolitical. Obviously, you were leading government officials in the previous administration, but this is purely from a biblical, I would say even a heart perspective, the film. Um, but I have to ask you both, you played such obviously a pivotal leading role in making the Abraham Accords a reality. Are you a little bit disappointed that we haven't seen more nations come into the Accords since your tenure ended? A little surprised, maybe? Uh, disappointed, for sure. What, yeah. what it took, Eric, uh, to get it the, to the finish line is it took leadership. It took people who were prepared to take risks. Your point about the State Department. Look, if you go look at the early days where it began to leak out that we were working on this project, although I will say we were able to keep this very quiet for yeah. a very long time. Uh, but as it began to leak out, the resistance was enormous, right? Because it proved false what people had believed for decades, which is you can't fix this problem until you resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Was that, that, I'm sorry, Secretary, yeah. that, that yeah. comment John Kerry, the former Secretary of yes, State yes. made, 
Uh, no way will this happen without a Palestinian state. It'll never happen. Israel normalizing relations with other Arab yeah, nations. Yeah, when I'm a little down, I just play that video at home for myself <laughs> and make myself feel good for just a moment. Uh, but but more, more seriously, um, we couldn't have foreseen precisely how this would go either. And to your point about extending this to other nations, it takes real leaders. We were blessed. We had Mohammed bin Zayed. We had the uh, uh, the Crown Prince and the leadership in Bahrain. We had, a, we had President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu, all of whom were working this problem and could see that their country would be better off. Yeah. We shouldn't forget uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman. And while they've not signed on, um, they were important in making sure that everybody understood that this would be something that, that was palatable yeah. and acceptable uh, in the holy sites of Mecca and Medina as well. And so a yeah. complicated history resolved by just common sense and goodwill and amazing leadership. And so I, it, it required, too, a United States that was deeply pro-Zionist, yeah. that deeply understood the historic importance of the nation of Israel. When you create a separation or countries aren't sure if you're going to uh, be with the Israelis or going to negotiate with the Iranians, you can't extend the Abraham Accords. They, yeah. th- these, these are part of a, a mosaic that is important. And you have to get all the pieces right. And we were very blessed uh, that we had the right leaders in place uh, at our embassy and all across the world uh, that built this mosaic and got this outcome. I, I pray that we find a more space to continue to expand peace in the Middle East. It's entirely possible and it's a good thing for everyone. Yeah, gentlemen, it seems like Saudi Arabia would be the big one. I know that uh, in interviewing Prime Minister Netanyahu for TBN, he said that would be a quantum leap if we were to make peace with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and by the way, this is not your first rodeo, Route 60. You were also stars of the great TBN documentary, The Abraham Accords, incredible four-part series featuring Secretary Pompeo, Ambassador Friedman, former President Trump, former Vice President Pence, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Arab leaders, many others in that incredible four-part TBN documentary, The Abraham Accords. You can watch that on demand at tbn.org. And of course, visit route60.movie September 18th and 19th. The film, it's finally here, Route 60, The Biblical Highway. It is, to me, groundbreaking. Well, this building is so complex archaeologically, politically, historically, but the sanctity behind it all is the claim that the hill behind this wall is the Golgotha, the hill of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. The Romans would put someone to death on a prominent hill where the punishment will be public, so everyone will be terrified by their power. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which, in Aramaic, is called Golgotha. John 19, verse 17. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ and the chosen of God. Luke 23, verse 34 and 35. Gentlemen, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. I don't say that lightly. Um, For a former Secretary of State, former ambassador uh, to Israel, to kind of, I don't want to say let your hair down a little bit, but hey, (laughs) you're rolling those sleeves up, you're kind of on the ground, and it's not not, uh, politics 24-7 that you're talking about. You're kind of getting down to the essence of it, the spiritual essence uh, of the land of Israel. It is completely unique, and we're so proud uh, at TBN that this film is coming to fruition and that you are both part of it. David, can you speak to that uniqueness of this project? Again, I'm not saying this lightly. There has not been anything like this with the players involved, the subject matter, to hit the screen. You know, Eric, not only has uh, there never been a film made by a former Secretary of State and Ambassador to Israel on this territory, or any territory, frankly, in Israel, uh, no Secretary of State or Ambassador, other than the two of us, have ever set foot in any of this territory. 
I mean, uh, this is uh, this is a one of a kind film, and um, the land, of course, has been there for three thousand years or four thousand years. The yeah. land has been there forever, but um, uh, the opportunity for the two of us to show it off, uh, I think, is is both unique and a real labor of love. You're both. You can't help yourselves. You're making history again. You did it while you're in office. Now you're doing it again with this film, Route 60, The Biblical Highway. Gentlemen, final thoughts. This was great. Uh, The film is absolutely stunning, visually stunning. The stories, the history, absolutely incredible. Uh, Final thoughts here. And talk about some of the places that you hit that were near and dear to your heart. Uh, All of them, obviously. But anything that jumped out in particular. I know we've talked about Joshua's Altar, which is an amazing site. Off the beaten path, quite literally, uh, in Samaria, but talk about some of your favorite moments. And is there anything, well, I'm sure you learned a lot from some of the spots that you visit, anything that really jumped out to you where you said, wow, and it was kind of a game changer for you? You get the tough one first. You know, um, I, I don't want to choose favorites because I love them yeah. all. Um, I think there are a few places that really demonstrate the, the triumph and the tragedy of the Jewish people. Um, one of which I think is is Bethel. You know, there's a million towns in America called Bethel, right? Because it's mm-hmm. such a significant place. Now we think of Bethel as the place where Jacob, you know, dreamed of angels ascending and descending from a ladder going That's up right. to heaven, and he was given this covenant by God that he'd become a great nation. You know, sometime later, you know, when um, when you know Bethel became um, the uh, it was it was taken over by by a, sort of a, a non God fearing king. And, um, and it became a, uh, a, a duplicate tabernacle compared to the one in Jerusalem by King Jeroboam. And what does he do? He goes and instead of, because he doesn't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore, what does he do? Second place, he goes out and builds another golden calf. Can you imagine that? A second golden calf. But it just shows you how the, 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 the pathway to, to God and to, to God-fearing, at least for the, for, for the Jewish people, there, there, there are always these temptations along the road, yeah. and we have to conquer them. We have to be able to control them. And, you know, it's a great lesson that, you know, you think you have things under control. You think you're on the right path. Don't be so sure. You know, check yourself. At, you, know, you know, check your direction. You know, check your, 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 uh, your coordinates, yeah. you know, all the time to make sure you're doing the right thing. Because, you know, it's, the, the potential to slip is, is always there, and, uh, and we got to be careful about it. I think Bethel is a great... Uh, example to me of, of, of both that, that triumph with Jacob and that, that, that low point with Jeroboam. And I think of the parallels here with the United States, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, great point there, Ambassador Friedman. Secretary, one of the things that struck me about the film is you look like you're having fun. You both did. <laughs> now, you had a smile on your face throughout. Yeah. And you're like, man, I'm really standing here. Uh, it seemed like you had a blast uh, with Route 60. What were some of the most memorable moments for you? You know, it was it was a lot of fun, yeah. um, but it was also so reinforcing uh, for all the things that I've spent my life as I tried to learn to be to, to understand the Bible and to read it, and then you know the the, the duty to teach it when I was a fifth grade Sunday school teacher, uh, where cartoons and pictures. Now I was standing in these places and and even places that I, I'd been before. So we went to Gethsemane, a place that you know, a lot of folks who go to visit Israel can get to. It's pretty easily accessible. Uh, I mean, we all we all know that story. Um, but to go to Gethsemane after having now walked in these other places provided a connectedness to the Bible um, that was really special and unique. And that was certainly personal. I think when you watch Route 60, when you go see the movie, I think people will become connected to their faith, to their history, to their understanding of the Bible in ways uh, that'll be different and fun and joyous for them as well. It's a faith builder. I think the film is a faith builder for people watching and you've both been strong believers for years. But I think for people watching at home as well, wow, to see it all come to life uh, before your very eyes, incredible. Look, you know, the, the whole story of the, uh, of the Old Testament is God's covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they, will, that they will inherit the land, right? He doesn't say to them, believe in me and go off, you know, wherever you want. It's, you're going to inherit this land. This land is tied to, to, to our faith. And, and what, is the, what is the punishment? To the Jewish people, when God says, if you don't believe in me, I'm going to throw you out of the land, right? I mean, it's always about the land. The, the Judaism without the land, it's, it's, it's not complete. And so, you know, it's not only as a faith builder, it is the essence of our faith that we will be on this land and flourish on this land and, and observe God's will on this land. Yeah, absolutely 
Incredible journey uh, along Route 60, the biblical highway, September 18th and 19th. Gentlemen, you're excited about this release. I know we were talking before the interview, and you guys are really sucked up for this. Yeah. Completely. It's going to be completely yeah. sucked up. It's going to yeah. be great. A lot of hard work went into it, and the results are there for everyone to see. And you may never have been to Israel. We encourage you to join on our TBN tour this November, by the way. But if you have never been to Israel, it's on your bucket list. Man, oh, man. You are in the driver's seat uh, for Route 60, the biblical highway. You're going to every, literally, quite, quite literally, <laughs> every relevant, iconic, legendary site that you've read about in your Bible from the time you were a little kid. And what better guides than former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Gentlemen, thank you so much. God bless you both. It's incredible. Good luck with the film. We'll be watching September 18th and 19th in theaters nationwide, Route60.movie. For the entire team of praise, for Ambassador Friedman, Secretary Pompeo, God bless, and we'll see you soon.